welcome everyone here today on behalf of Connect and the Southeast Mass STEM Network. I just wanted to welcome you to our diversity, equity, and inclusion program. My name is Stacey Kaminsky, and I'm the executive director of Connect, which is the consortium of the six public institutions of higher ed in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar with us, we include Bridgewater State, um, Bristol Community College, Cape Cod Community College, Massachusetts Maritime Academy, Massasoit Community College, and UMass Dartmouth. Um, and Connect provides oversight for the Southeast Mass STEM Network, which as you all know, is expertly led by our network manager, Catherine Honey. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with our program, this is actually the fourth summer that we've hosted an event in advance of STEM Week to help generate excitement among our regional STEM stakeholders and enthusiasts, but only the second time we've done so virtually. So for those of you who are on last year, you'll remember me saying um, that uh, it truly feels like a STEM experiment for me with a very hem heavy emphasis on the T. Um, right now. So I'm sure everything will go well. And I know we're, we're more than patient with one another um, when technology is involved, but um, certainly it's, it's a whole new proposition, even though we've been using Zoom for 18 months now. Um, as I mentioned before, we're so pleased to see so many familiar participants and so many new ones as well. Typically, the majority of our attendees come from the Southeast Mass region, uh, but since we're virtual again this year, we have participants joining us from all of our regional networks and their catchment areas. So we really want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I'd just like to take an opportunity to briefly review our agenda and the information that I sent on the breakout sessions. As you can see on the agenda, and I'll post it in a second, um, we have a whole group panel discussion following my welcome, re welcoming remarks this morning. Um, and then we'll have a 15 minute transition period during which I can move everyone into their workshops, um, especially the workshop facilitators. I'm hoping that once I open the, the breakout rooms, um, other people, the other participants who aren't facilitating workshop sessions can actually move themselves into workshop sessions. Um, but that's going to be a trial and error. So um, once everyone has been moved, um, as I said, we're hoping you'll be able to select your own session. If not, just write to me in the chat and I will be happy to put you in your desired section. Um, so room one is computational thinking. Room two is hurricane heroes. And room three is making positive changes. Um, I'd now like to introduce Pat Monteith, who will introduce our student speaker. And after um, Yavanji provides remarks, I'm gonna ask Mike that you just jump right in and get started with a panel, okay? So thank you everyone, enjoy the day, and we look forward to seeing you throughout the day. Hi, my name is Pat Monteith, and I've had the extreme pleasure to uh, work with Yvonne Jakes over the past year. Um, I met him when he attended a few of my um, STEM workshops at the Brockton Public Library, and he seemed very interested in STEM. And so when I found out he was last year going into his freshman year at the um, Avon Middle High School, um, I reached out to his mom and said, I would love to be able to um, get Ivanji um, involved in the science fair and in the NAACP Act So competition. And the rest, as they say, is history. I've had a wonderful time working with him. He participated in the regional science fair, the state science fair, and he went on to the Act So regional and uh, our local and national competition. Um, he's a rising sophomore at uh, uh, Avon Middle High School and quite the accomplished pianist in addition to um, being uh, someone who's interested in STEM. And uh, uh, Ivanji, why don't you uh, give us a little bit about your interest in STEM and what factors have contributed to the obvious success you've had in the field? Thank you. So in terms of what factors that have contributed to the success that I've had in STEM so far, I'd have to say the biggest thing is really all my mentors and the group support I've received throughout my projects, because throughout all these projects, it's really a group effort. I worked on it, but you know, you always need some help sometimes in certain areas. 
So it was really one of the big factors that helped like you, Pat, who helped me and plus my MSEF mentor and a few other people who helped me along my journey. So I have to say that was one of the biggest factors that contributed to my success in STEM. So can you talk a bit about um, your interest in STEM as a career? Yes. So for STEM as a career, I really, I'm really interested in STEM. And what I want to do in terms of careers, I want to be a neurosurgeon, which a neurosurgeon is a surgeon that focuses on the nervous system and the brain as well. So that's really the one, the big, my biggest interest in STEM in terms of career pathways. What do you think influenced um, that as a career choice? Um, I have to say the biggest thing that influenced my career pathway and what I wanted was, so when I was around eight years old-ish, I have to say, I watched the movie Ben Carson, The Gifted Hands, and it was such a really profound movie it really opened my eyes and it was shocking because Ben Carson even though he was he still is a world-renowned neurosurgeon he didn't have the best you know growing up his mom didn't know how to read and he had troubles and struggling in school but even throughout these hardship uh, he still and the odds are stacked against him he made it big <coughs> So um, one final question here. You know, many attendees um, today are interested in increasing the number of underrepresented students in STEM. What advice do you have for them about programs and practices you believe might increase the number of students interested in and in succeeding in STEM and pursuing STEM careers? I'm glad you asked. My biggest piece of advice is to get into as many programs and activities as you can. That's really it. Because me, myself, I was very active in the library and throughout my local library. That's really how I got to where I am now through all these events, like events that you did for certain NASA things, as well as other science events. So that's really the thing, because MSEF and AXO, they really opened my eyes when it came to STEM. And now I want to try as many STEM programs and competitions as I can now. And one of the things that really helped kind of was the pandemic, which kind of seems weird, but it's really introduced virtual events and activities. So you wouldn't have to travel cross country, you could just be in your living room and access an event anywhere. So I think that attending events is, and getting deeply involved in STEM is really going to expand your knowledge to progress in your studies easily. I have no more questions. Thank you, Ivanji. I know Ivanji's on his way to a music camp at Berkeley College of Music right now. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate that you took the time out to come and join us and share your thoughts um, because this is a very important subject and uh, we really um, enjoyed your perspective on the subject. Thank you. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you very uh, much, and good luck at music. Mike, yep, go ahead. Well, how inspiring was that, Yvonne? Thank you so much. There's, there's lots of promise in our in our youth, and uh, you are certainly beyond your years right now. Keep up the great work. Thank good morning, you. everyone. I am, uh, I am going to be moderating our panel today. We have five panelists. Uh, we will each have an introduction and, and talk very briefly about our uh, – activity and, and STEM along with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we will go through some questions. And if we have time afterwards, we'll, I guess we'll take questions from, uh, from the audience. Um, I am, again, Michael Tomasi, President and CEO of AccuRounds. We do contract precision machining here in Avon, Massachusetts. I'm a second generation family business owner, the son of an immigrant. So I have that appreciation 
Um, we are involved in many different activities across STEM and DEI within our company. Um, at the national level, I co-chair a group called Business Leaders United for Workforce Partnerships that strictly focuses on workforce development funding through the federal government to get down to the state level. Uh, we recently convened an industry recovery panel, which I am on, which has met with the White House to focus on an inclusive recovery. So a very big focus on, on equity. Um, at the state level, I served in the Governor's STEM Advisory Council for seven years. I currently co-chair the Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative with Secretary Keneally. And again, both of those efforts um, have a strong focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, at the local level, we do a lot here at Acumons and our team. We're very involved with hiring co-ops from Voc Tech schools, juniors and seniors. We host plant tours. We do teacher externships, um, sponsor robotics programs, get involved in STEM activities. Um, so all focused around two main areas, promoting our industry and making people realize what great careers there are. Of course, we're involved with STEM there and um, getting different workforce development initiatives off the ground. Uh, we work at seven different gateway cities right now, promoting uh, these efforts. I'm currently serving on the Career Champions Network at Madison Park. We're looking to prop that program up and start actually a, an advanced manufacturing training center. Again, looking at the inner city of Boston and, and attracting uh, diversity into our field and into the STEM uh, uh, world. Uh, we work with English, English for New Bostonians. We've hosted ESL classes here. Um, a very interesting opportunity that we're working on right now is a uniquely able project, which was founded in California. It, it takes certain kids uh, on the spectrum and puts them through a machining training program, and they're very employable. And we are engaging with the state right now to create funding to start a program on the North Shore. And if that is successful, we will start one in south of Boston and then west of Boston. And finally, we're celebrating our longest term uh, employee uh, for 45 years. He is old as the company is. He's in his 70s and he is deaf and mute. So we're involved across the, across the spectrum when it comes to STEM and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I guess next we're going to have uh, Chris. Yes. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Ajemian, president, co-president with Catherine Honey of Massachusetts AAUW and president of the Taunton Area branch of AAUW and a member of BCCR. You'll hear more about that community group later. Um, I'm uh, pleased to talk about how, how AAUW has supported DEI and STEM education for women and girls from its beginnings to the present. The American Association of University Women was formed in 1881 in Boston by a group of women to support education and equity for women and girls. For 140 years, AEOW has supported women through a fellowship and grants program, through research, and through ongoing STEM education opportunities for girls, such as Tech Trek, Tech Savvy, and STEM Ed for Girls, a new program um, focusing on uh, high school girls of color. <clears throat> AUW recognized early on the importance of STEM skills and has granted a total of $115 million in fellowships and grants, five million this year, to women scholars. I'd like to mention a few of those remarkable women. Uh, Marie, Madame Marie Curie purchased her gram of radium with the financial support of AAUW. We can call that an early milestone for women in STEM. Mae Jemison was the first black female astronaut to travel in space. And Judith Resnick, both, she, both of them were AUW fellows, was the second woman chosen for NASA's astronaut program. If you remember, she and teacher Krista McAuliffe died in the Challenger disaster in 1986. AUW member, Dr. Nancy Grace Roman, the first chief of astronomy at NASA, is known as the mother of the Hubble telescope. And district attorney, Rachel Rollins, an AAUW fellow, will be the first black female US attorney in Massachusetts when she's confirmed. AUW has done some groundbreaking research on women in the STEM fields, as well as in other areas. Some of that research has revealed the resistance and harassment that women in STEM fields often encounter. We need nothing less than a deep cultural change to increase the retention of women in the fields and to take full advantage of the talents women bring to STEM fields. 
In 2020, when the whole world shifted to an internet platform that required digital skills, canyon-sized gaps appeared <clears throat> between those who could make that tr transition and those who couldn't. I believe that if we all work together, STEM education can provide women and girls with the skills to help close those gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next, Dr. Jim Cobbs. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Jim Cobbs. I'm currently the Executive Director of Operations for Brooklyn Public Schools. And for the past eight years, I've been the principal of Edison Academy, which is a evening alternative high school for the students. Um, and you know, I, as, I also am a with Influence 100 fellow working with the Department of Education. And, and um, you know, it's a program that DESE has designed to essentially in over a five year period in, with five different cohorts of, of uh, aspiring superintendents to, to have more student superintendents of color in the state of Massachusetts. So it's been an interesting program. We just completed the first year, have another year to go. And, and it's, uh, it's designed to not only to develop st superintendents of color, but also to for those, those fellows to work with their school districts to help the diversity and equity inclusion program and, and take a look at you know, where they are on, on the spectrum, if you will, of the continuum of, of becoming a more diverse school district in terms of you know, teachers and, and certainly administrators. So it's been an interesting program and it, uh, it certainly needed, and it, it, it's the program, it, it's not, there's two of us fellows that are in the program, but it also, it involves, you know, district leadership, the superintendent, and others to help, you know, again, Dr. Cantell is one of the people that, to kind of look at where we are and, and move us along as far as becoming more inclusive and, and diverse uh, staff. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cobbs. Uh, next, Yvette Joyce. Good morning, I'm Yvette Joyce, and uh, my relation here is uh, I work for Brockton Public Schools as a teacher. I'm a reading teacher, and you may be thinking, what does that have to do with STEM? Um, I actually spent my first 20 years of my career as a software engineer, uh, working in GIS, having been trained by uh, Bridgewater State College, Vern Domingo, hello. Um, definitely props to uh, the education I received there. And uh, working for the environmental protection uh, was an amazing experience and seeing environmental justice or injustice uh, in my career and moving eventually uh, into teaching as some things that I saw as, as I'll share when, when we get to the panel. Uh, but having worked in the STEM field as a person of color was a very interesting experience, especially here in the Northeast. A um, lot of experiences that really led me into education and realizing that I was always the only um, as I would go from uh, location to location and transitioning to teaching because I didn't want to have the next generation be the only female or the only person of color and experience the things that I did. And so motivated me to uh, transition into teaching and seeing how many more people we could bring along. Uh, with the Brockton Public Schools, I'm involved in a lot of um, uh, efforts that try to recruit new teachers, uh, diverse teachers, and um, we'll talk more about that later, but different efforts that they're making and I'm personally making to make sure that that happens. And um, it's been a great ride. Nice to meet you all. Excellent. Thanks, Yvette. Next, Dr. Chandra Oral. Hi, everybody. I'm Chandra Oral. I'm a professor of mathematics education at UMass Dartmouth, where I also serve as a research scientist in the Caput Center for Research and Innovation in STEM Education. Um, on the research front, I've spent more than 20 years um, working with math educators to try to improve the kinds of mathematics experiences that upper elementary and middle school students end up getting. Um, and now I'm moving into the area of computational thinking with that work. As the director of the Caput Center, I've been involved in a number of major outreach projects, including um, our best known one, which is STEM for Girls, where we bring about between 150 and 200 girls to campus for a day of hands-on, minds-on STEM activities. And we particularly recruit from Fall River, New Bedford, to try to get um, students who otherwise would possibly never even step foot on a college campus, even though we're only 10 miles away from them. 
So um, I'm working from the, the position of the Caput Center, which is democratizing access. And we see that as being one way of democratizing access. And in um, my newest grant, the Computational Thinking Counts Grant, which is what the workshop later is tied to, um, we're looking at how to democratize access to computational thinking by bringing it into um, elementary classrooms as part of math and science instruction, instead of keeping computational thinking sort of relegated to after school activities that aren't um, accessible to so many students. Excellent. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Mike. Um, my name is Pat Monteith. Um, I actually wear a number of different STEM hats. You know, when I was a teenager, like Ivanji, I wanted to go work for NASA. Ended up in a different career. And then when I retired from UMass Boston uh, eight or nine years ago, uh, I found my way back into STEM, both through the NASA Solar Ambassador Program, um, as well as working with students um, and helping them improve their science fair projects. Um, in addition to having just served seven years as the co-chair of the NAACP in Brockton Act SOAP program, um, I was also the primary STEM mentor to all the students who competed. And I'm thrilled to mention that not only did a number of those students win local gold, but went on to the national competition to win gold. Um, I've also, I also created the Makerspace at the Brockton Public Library and have been running programs there, except for the last year and a half, of course, um, for uh, three or four years um, for both middle school and high school students and uh, even worked with a number of high school students in a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program with the younger students, which was extremely successful. Um, one of the hats I'm wearing right now is I've just become co-chair of the Region 5 uh, Science Fair, Science and Engineering Fair, which encompasses all of the South Shore, in addition to the uh, private and parochial schools in Boston. Don't ask how that connection is made, but <laughs> it has. Um, and we're trying to overhaul the Region 5 Science Fair. Um, I, you know, if you're a teacher, I hope that your students will participate. Um, I cannot tell you enough, and I will probably give you some more details in a few minutes of the importance of students having hands-on experience in science. And it's just a, a wonderful opportunity for them. I'm also involved in the National Council of Negro Women Boston chapter. And um, thanks to Senator Mike Brady, I was recently uh, honored with uh, being named as a Commonwealth, Commonwealth heroine of Massachusetts class of 2021. Excellent, thanks Pat. And thanks again for all our panelists for participating today. We certainly have a, a very interesting background and cross section. So we're gonna go into the questions uh, right now and I'm gonna start with, uh, with Chris. Chris, can you give us an example of something you've done as an AAUW member that helps students see the relationship between what they were studying and potential career opportunities? Oh, Chris, you're on mute. So sorry. <laughs> Um, I was involved with an AUW-funded program at Massasoit Community College when I was on the faculty there. Uh, we organized a non-traditional STEM Careers Day to introduce students to fields beyond, beyond the health career. Students uh, at Massasoit, were, many of them were um, focused on getting into the nursing program, the respiratory program, uh, and they accepted so few students that often they were disappointed. So we asked these students to research a career including job prospects, salary, and any advanced education necessary for, enough for a position that they were researching. Uh, the research was displayed on bulletin boards on campus where others could see them. Students attended a, a panel a discussion on STEM careers where an architect, an engineer, uh, a conservation biologist, a medical information technologist, and a microbiologist, all women, spoke about their career paths. And one of the students was able to attend um, the National Conference of College Women Student Leaders, sponsored by AUW, 
uh, and she described it as a life-changing life experience to be uh, involved with so many uh, young women from colleges all over the country, um, hearing wonderful uh, speeches uh, from women of achievement and being exposed to networking, leadership skill development on all of that. And it was very exciting. That's great. I, I certainly think in, in our world, there's no substitute for getting people on site and touring our facility. When, when mm -hmm. people see all the different roles that you could play within manufacturing at STEM, mm -hmm. uh, you can really make that connection. And we, we actually toured 154th graders from Brockton a couple of years ago. And uh, at first we were a little hesitant, but I'll tell you what, of all the tours we've done, those were one of the most exciting tours. The kids were all lit up and at a very early age, they have an impression of STEM and, and advanced manufacturing. So thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Cobbs, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has launched Influence 100 to increase the race, racial and ethnic diversity of superintendents in Massachusetts and support school districts in efforts to diversify their educator workforce. You are an influence fellow. What does a program involve for fellows and how does it support school districts? Good morning, so, so great question. So the, the real, I think the, the essence of the program is, yes, it's one to develop in, you know, in potential school superintendents of color, you know, and, and, and certainly more are needed in Massachusetts. Um, but I, I think to me, the real work for it is to, to help the district kind of take a look at where they are, you know, as, again, on the, on the continuum of, of being more inclusive and, and diverse, particularly with, with administrative positions, because, you know, as you, as you know, probably the city of Brockton is, is 60 percent, you know, of population of color. And, and in, this, in the school district, you know, the students are probably 80 percent, but the, the teaching staff is, is maybe 20 percent and, and administrative staff is, is, is even less, much less than that. So, you know, for us, to, it, it really gives us the opportunity kind of through a guided, guided experience over two years through the Department of Education uh, to take a look at the district and see what we can do to make improvements and make changes and, and, and bring more people of color. You know, one of the things that we've, we've been working on, again, Dr. Moran is the other, the other participant this year as a, as a fellow. And we're, we're looking at, you know, we have, we have a number of, of paraprofessionals and monitor teachers assistant MTAs in the district that are, you know, many of them are aspiring to become teachers, and and it, but it's 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 not easy. And, and Yvette can speak to, you know, the the Inspire uh, program that she's in to for these people to afford to the, the classes to get to, to take the Intel test to, you know, to some of them are, are close. To, some of them already have even bachelor's degrees, or, or, and, and they're looking to get certified. So. Um, many of those people, they're in the schools already, they're in the district already, and, and in fact, are in the classroom teaching, but they're not teachers, they're not paid as teachers. So, you know, we, we really need to take a look at those, and, and we are, you know, working to get those people, whatever they need to finish, to get over the finish line and get certified and, and, and become classroom teachers. Um, also, the district has a internship program each year that, you know, that we, we bring in you know teaching staff from the schools and and they they kind of um, they they work with people in the district at the administrative level here in the central office or the principals to to kind of get a sense of what school administration looks like and 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 help those people to perhaps you know start them on the road to getting licensed as administrators to work in the district. So you know, it, it, it certainly helps us a lot and, and it keeps us focused on, you know, what are we doing and, and, and keep doing the work to, you know, to be more diverse and more inclusive. And and I will say Superintendent Thomas is very much committed to this, you know, and, and work, working diligently to continue the efforts to, to more diversity and inclusion for the district. That sounds like a tremendous program, Dr. Cobbs. One, one little follow-up question, um, is there, is the demand to, to increase and to get involved there, or are you doing more reaching out and trying to pull people along? Um, it, it's a little of both. You know, we we have advertised several times again for the teachers' assistants and, and the professionals in the district to, you know, if they're interested in, in becoming licensed certified teachers to, to, you know, so we have certain cohorts again, 
Yvette can probably tell you more how many cohorts we have and, and where people are, but it's working, you know, we're, you know, and I know at Edison Academy, I've, I've had several of my teacher's assistants and, and professionals that are now licensed teachers and, and teaching at Edison Academy as well. So it, it's working, it's coming. That's excellent. Good to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's uh, move on to Yvette. I'll, I'll just, I'll do a, a quick follow-up question there, Yvette. You know, what supports are in place at Brockton Public Schools to recruit and retain a diverse educator workforce? Sure. There are a lot now, uh, so many more than when I started. So it's really exciting to be part of BPS right now. Um, as uh, Dr. Cobbs was just mentioning, uh, we have the JET program, which is specifically designed to help people who are paraprofessionals uh, move into getting their bachelor's degree. So in Brockton, the paraprofessional is someone who is a teaching assistant without a degree. And so our goal is to get them uh, both their degree, and many of them are attending Massasoit and Bridgewater. So we have relationships with those two colleges locally um, to help students along, and, or adult students. And um, the, uh, the JET program actually provides funding and support that Brockton is uh, very closely related to. And they help with uh, paying for MTELs, and, uh, and Brockton also has another funding. So they're basically two funding sources to help with the MTEL payment and to help with uh, grants. Um, just as a matter of fact, as we're on this workshop, I just got a text from somebody who said they remembered the, uh, the flyer and was asking me for advice on how to become a teacher. So I'm like, yay. Um, so <laughs> the word is getting out. Um, and, and it's really exciting because, you know, a lot of our paras and MTAs are, you know, bilingual, trilingual. I mean, many of them speak four or five languages. They are the heart of the community. And um, like Dr. Cobb said, I love the fact that our new superintendent realizes the, the richness that we have in our paras and MTA, and we're getting the programs going uh, to, to, to get them. With the people who already have bachelor's degrees, we're helping them with uh, MTELs. We have MTEL workshops that we are having teachers who are good at test taking, you know, train the people who are interested so that since they have the MTEL, okay, let's just get you a workshop to know how to pass it and then get you into the classroom in those transitions, you know, they don't happen quickly, um, but they, they do happen. Uh, and then uh, again, the, the DESE fellowship to recruit, uh, paying for the MTELs. And then uh, we, ha we now have an affinity group uh, for people of color in, in Brockton that just started last year and it was very successful. Um, and it's just a great way for people to bounce ideas off of each other, to get advice on, um, work situations and uh, just, you know, just to have that support, which again, um, is so valuable. I, I just can't say enough of the, the difference that it has made in the time that I've been uh, in BPS, having all these, all these things that are really bringing that diversity into the classrooms and um, making, it a, making the classrooms reflect the community and it's, it's just been amazing. Uh, the mentor program that they've also started having young people from the community come in and help um, mentor the children. They're just, they're just, you know, often, you know, African-American men and they just provide advice. So they're not uh, certified guidance counselors, but they're just role models. And I've seen some of them help my students, especially during the pandemic, just encourage them and, and believe in themselves and see somebody who's you know, mature and made it. And uh, it, it's been really exciting seeing all the different changes in the ways that uh, the city is moving forward to help our students. So hopefully that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's fantastic to hear because I certainly think that's a hugely important piece in establishing a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce is having it at the, at the teacher level so they have mentors and, and uh, they can, it's more relatable, right? As you mentioned. Um, one more question for you, before becoming an educator, you worked in private and public sector for 20 years, as you mentioned, as a software engineer. And I know you touched on it, but maybe expand a little bit on what motivated you to become an educator. Sure, I think a lot of um, things kind of happened um, as I was doing really exciting things. I 
you know, was doing cancer research. I think one of the things I learned at Bridgewater was make your maps uh, solve problems, right? And so that was part of my, I was very fortunate to be able to go get into a very good program. The program I was in was small, right? I don't know how big it is now, but at the, at the time, the geography program was small enough. We had relationships with all of the, of the teachers, the professors. And so I always had that mindset. And so as I was going through my career, solving problems, you know, making maps that, you know, investigated cancer rates, uh, making maps that solved, you know, leakage with underground storage tanks and, and found out where those problems were. Again, I just, I started seeing more and more where I was, you know, typically the only one in the, in the room like me. And, and, you know, I grew up in, in Brockton when Brockton was, the majority of Brockton was white. So it wasn't like, it was a conflict to me to be the only one. But what I realized was, you know, there's gotta be a reason why. It's not like I'm the only person that, um, you know, of color that would be interested in this. This is great. I mean, I'm really changing the world by mapping, by doing this, this STEM career. Um, and, you know, I talked to a lot of friends about it and what it really came down to was people just didn't realize it just wasn't on their radar. You know, I started talking to young people and they would say things like, yeah, I'm going to be a, a football star and I'm going to be a basketball star. And it's like, okay, that's great. But what if it doesn't work out? What are you going to do? Um, and, and, you know, I started thinking about it and, and actually what finally pushed me was my boss, I was working for what's now um, National Grid, and my boss said, hey, I'm going to send you to this, uh, this workshop. It's, it's a year-long workshop to train you uh, to work on this new software for mapping. And I sat down and I thought about it, and I said, you know what? If I'm going to go to a year-long workshop to be trained, I'm going to go be, be trained as a, as a teacher. And I, I thought, I thought if I'm going to dedicate, I, I'm going to really dedicate it. You know, I went home and I talked to my husband. I'm like, this, this is what I'm thinking. He's like, go for it. And, um, and I did because I said, I want to make, I want to change the world. And, and I'd always said when I was younger, when I grow up, I'll be a teacher. And I said, I'm almost grown up. You know, I was almost 40. And I said, you know, I'm almost grown up. I'm going to go be a teacher. And, um, and I just loved it. Um, got into the classroom, uh, first taught in, in the private school, Trinity Catholic Academy, uh, and then moved into BPS. And, and I just love it. I love opening the students' eyes. I love, um, you know, answering the questions. And uh, it, there's just, I don't regret a day of it. That is fantastic. So admirable. Uh, congratulations. You made that switch. And it's it's so important for our kids to have especially coming out of the working world and, and you can pull on those experiences in the classroom. I'm sure you do all the time. Uh, Dr. Oro, question for you. How do we ensure that all students have the opportunity to pursue and realize their goals while preparing to enter a 21st century workplace? So I think what we need to do is think about how we provide students with access to opportunities to develop their 21st century skills. So I'm talking about creativity and critical thinking, being able to work together, um, communication, perseverance, um, you know, all of all of those kinds of soft skills that aren't tested on the, the MCAS every year. Right now, too often, those those um, kinds of ideas are only available to students who are in particular groups. So a lot of times gifted students, for example, get those opportunities and they should absolutely have them, but all the students should have them. And um, too often there are, can also happen after school or in supplemental education, which again has barriers to access for a lot of students if they don't have a ride to get there, if they don't have the means to pay for it. So we need to think about how do we open up our classrooms, how do we open up experiences for these students in the school day to allow them to develop the, um, those skills? We need to rethink the purpose of K-12. Um, from my perspective, it should be all about opening doors, giving students opportunities to try new things, all kinds of new things, um, giving them a safe place to fail and to learn how to come back from failure, um, building habits and dispositions that are gonna serve them well in the workplace and in their day-to-day -day life, and giving them opportunities to learn how to learn which is probably the most important thing that we can teach them because they're going to be relearning over and over again for their entire career once they're out of school. 
You know, I'm so glad you brought up the soft skill piece. You know, at at Accurounds, we have five core values, gratitude, excellence, team first, initiative, and trust. And they developed over the years. It started from my father with three, and we added two more in the, in the last several years. And, and we have guiding principles, three bullets that are basically behaviors that uh, help outline those core values. And you know, when, when I talk to students and, and kids when they tour here, I said, it's so important to understand you know, how to act and, 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 and behave, because if you, can, if you can understand and abide by those core values, you can do anything. That's really the basis for anything. We'll teach you. I, I talk all the time and tell people, we'll hire attitude over talent all day long. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't know how to, you know, put the team first and, and collaborate and communicate, you know, and appreciate things and take initiative, then you're not going to survive and you're not going to be a part, you're not going to certainly be successful as part of our team. And it may not be for everybody and that's fine, but you know, you got to kind of set those guidelines to on how to operate. And, and one more point that, that I think facilitates a lot of that are, are robotics programs. I know many of many people on the call are involved in some way in, in different robotics programs. There's this first, there's a the national robotics league, but, but what that does at the middle and high school level is, it puts students in that troubleshooting mode. They have to learn how to work as a team. You know, they have to they have to face adversity, and um, it really teaches them some valuable lessons as they move on. Whether they go to to, to college or they don't go to college, because college isn't for everybody. But learning is lifelong, and that's so important. So, thank you, Doctor, for your comments. Uh, Pat, mentorship consists of a long term relationship focused on supporting the growth and development of the mentee. A role model is a person other people admire for their accomplishments, skills, and values. In your experience, and you have a lot of it, what is the importance of mentoring and role models in increasing the interest and success of students in STEM studies? That's a great question, Mike. You know, over the past eight years, as I said, I've worked pretty closely with students at the Brockton Public Library, both in STEM workshops and in the makerspace. And I've also mentored STEM students in the NAACP's AXO program and competition for high school students. I really cannot stress enough the importance of both mentoring and having role models in the success of these students. First of all, a sense of belonging is a key factor, instilling the confidence in these students that they belong in STEM and are capable of succeeding. This is especially true with women and persons of color. And it's equally important having mentors who are gender and ethnicity matched. When I first started working with both middle and uh, high school students to assist them in improving their science fair projects, I honestly didn't realize the importance of at least highlighting the accomplishments of diverse STEM professionals to help strengthen feelings of STEM belonging. Many of the students I worked with were, shall we say, acquiescing to their parents' wishes to get involved in STEM rather than it be something that they're interested in themselves. About three or four years ago, I remember reading a research study that suggested gender and ethnicity can impact feelings of acceptance with students from underrepresented groups who reported uncertainty about whether or not they felt they belonged in their academic STEM fields. As I look back over the uh, several dozen students I've worked with, um, I now see the most successful students knew someone in their family of their same gender or, or ethnicity uh, with a STEM career who served as a role model, or they became more engrossed in their projects once I introduced them to someone of their same gender or ethnicity in their field. While this is anecdotal, I believe there is truth to it. A dearth of similar peers and role models, as well as negative stereotypes work against students feeling they belong in a STEM field. When students do not perceive they are valued, accepted, and are legitimate members in their area of academic interest, they're less likely to persist on their own. STEM identity can be understood through either personal identity or social identity. You know, referring back to the study I mentioned previously, which was a real eye-opener for me, when students were asked um, what would encourage others of their same gender and ethnicity to pursue a STEM career, over half of the respondents stated that meeting STEM professionals of their own gender and ethnicity would be effective encouragement. If the goal here is to increase diversity among underrepresented groups in the workforce, 
then it seems imperative for employers to find a way to connect new underrepresented employees with mentors who look like them, even if the mentors are not members of their staff. Virtually these days, you can connect anybody with anybody, and I strongly encourage you to do it. I've seen some real success with the students I've worked with. Excellent. Thanks, Pat. Um, now, a question for the for the anybody on the panel. Um, you know, we work with co-ops. We work with a lot of six or seven different Vogue Tech schools, and we've had some diversity. We just hired in June a female from Southeastern, um, but not as much as you know we'd like to see. Um, how can we get more and more students into those? STEM roles at Vogue Tech Schools and maybe have them launch their careers earlier than later. Anybody want to take that one up? I, I, I'll just chime in, Michael. Um, one of the things that, you know, we actually just had this discussion yesterday morning in our executive team meeting. And one of the things that we, we're looking at, and, and I firmly believe anyway, that we really need to start earlier than high school. We, we need to reach further out to middle school, in, if not even elementary school, to, you know, to start, you know, to spark an interest, to explain what it looks like, to show, again, show students of color that, you know, people of color, like Yvette, you know, I, I come from a, you know, I'm a career changer too for several different careers, but, you know, that it's, it's to spark an interest, you know, to do summer camps. You, you said you had 150 fourth graders, you know, those are the students you need to start reaching out sooner, sooner to explain STEM and, and, and stop an interest in science. And I remember going to summer camp and we we built rockets and, and launched rockets. But, you know, when I was a kid, it's like, I was a city kid and I got a chance to 4 H to get out of the city and go to summer camp. It was like, wow, you know, this, this, this is cool. So I think we need to reach further out and not wait. High school, by the time you get a student in high school, they, they're kind of, you know, kind of heading one direction or another, or, you know, it's, it's harder to, I think spark an interest and really get them genuinely in, in, engaged in it. So that, that's what I think we need to reach further, further out and, and start it sooner than later. So. I would second that comment. Uh, certainly by high school, some minds are more fixed than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, middle school and even grade school, I mentioned the fourth graders, but middle school seems to be a prime mm -hmm. age group, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Are there more STEM programs being developed in those grades in Brockton or other school systems? Maybe it, it, it's something again that we talked about and I think we, we're going to work on we're going to look at our curriculum and instruction and and, and kind of really do some wholesale I think revamping and, and understanding what what our intent is and what our end goals are for students our products and, and and again make our students much more competitive by the time they leave high school you know we're, we're looking to do enrollment classes you know you know possibly, you know, associate degree um, or certificates and, and you know, different, you know, like, like at Edison Academy, we're doing a, a manufacturing certificate program for students. And so those, those are the things that we want to look at again sooner than later and, and have, you know, the high school students, you know, do, be, do internships at the, at the middle and, and elementary schools, you know, for the, with the students. So we're, we're taking a look at that and, and seriously, we kind of retooling of what we what we're doing and how we're doing it. That's great. You know, one thing we've learned in the last eighteen months, and, and we're zooming right now, right? But we've we pivoted from giving on site tours to virtual tours. Mm -hmm. We did a few different uh, high school tours virtually, and you know, maybe there's not the time to get out and take a half a day or a day to do a, a visit. Right. Certainly, virtual tours, and we have a YouTube channel. We post a ton of different videos, short videos. 90 second videos of, of you know, co-op students and, and younger adults and, and what they do and, and different roles in the organization. So that might be one opportunity to incorporate, you know, those types of um, learnings, video and virtual within some type of program that could be developed. Actually, you mentioned that, Michael, we could, we're working with, I'm very excited to work with Pat Monteith and, and Paul Engel at the, at the Broadway Public Library. He's a director. Um, they they have some grant funding coming in to for a uh, a portable inflatable <laughs> planetarium. You know that you know, that'll it's, it's going to be great to bring to the elementary schools and to the even the middle schools to have students participate in that. And it's like it, it's it's 
pretty exciting stuff, you know. Like, and, uh, so certainly the more, again, we can reach out to students at a younger age and get them excited about, you know, science and astronomy and, and wow. you know, what, what will spark for them. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I had sort of alluded to earlier is a program that we got some funding for at the Rockton Library um, probably three years ago through the Youth Service Alliance um, to work with and bring in a bunch of high school students to mentor the younger students in the makerspace. It was um, an eye opener for me as I sat back and watched these high school students really connect with middle school students in ways that I hadn't been able to do the previous year. So um, yes, the, there's so much that can be done with the middle school students, especially if you can involve students who are close to their age. Excellent, thanks for that, Pat. And, and back to mentoring and, and mentor, whenever we hire an individual to join our team, we on day one, set them up with a mentor, not, not necessarily the person they would be reporting to, but just somebody that they can go to, to talk, check in with on a daily, weekly basis, uh, just kind of on the side and just have another person to, to collaborate with. It's just important to have those, those established relationships. Um, just, to, I have a question maybe for the, the attendees, if there are people uh, on the call, on the Zoom call here that, that, maybe learn something or something that the panelists mentioned that resonated with or had an additional comment and um, feel free to feel free to chime in or put a hand up because I don't see any questions currently in the chat. We do have a few minutes left in our session. Um, is there anyone here that wants to comment on what they may have heard this morning? Is, is uh, Dr. Mangus, are you on the call? I see, I see your, your, your picture. Yeah. Because I, I actually, I, I love for him the opportunity to speak. You know, another exciting thing that we're, we're bringing to the high school is Doc, Dr. Mangus has a, a grant to for it. It's it's called the. Um, I just got to went blank. We, essentially, it's a hydroponic garden farm. You know, and, and it's in a self-contained unit that we'll be installing at the high school soon. So you know, that's another exciting you know, STEM and science. Uh, endeavor it um, you know thanks to dr mangus's work and you know with, with the grant funding we'll, we'll have that up and running for this for the school year i believe so. yeah good morning jim um so thank you the um <clears throat> state has um given us a an opportunity to purchase a uh, hydroponic freight farm um to address food insecurity um in the brockton community and so we're going to use that um to um not only be a teaching tool um, in our classrooms, but we're also going to help um, address food insecurity um, in the community. And, and the goal is to um, use some of that produce um, in our vocational and technical career programs. So students will learn about um, urban farming, um, marketing the produce um, to the community, um, as well as um, helping to alleviate some of the food deserts that, that exist in the community. And so um, we're eagerly awaiting the, the arrival of that um, here for the beginning of the, the school year. One of the things we did through the NAACP, and Phyllis might want to speak about this, Phyllis Ellis, who's the president of the Brockton branch, um, is we received a grant from the Brockton Cultural Council to create a garden, a cultural garden, behind um, the Keith Center. And, uh, Jim, you're probably familiar with it. Um, and it was really great because um, we were able to um, cordon off this area that had some raised beds. And we had the students involved from Champion High to come in and actually uh, plant the food. Uh, we had informational signage that were there. So the students understood the, you know, just like what, what Dave is talking about, understood um, the connection between um, food and their health um, and how food grows. Most students in urban communities haven't got a clue where the food comes from. Um, but I'm really proud, and I know Phyllis is very proud of the accomplishment of uh, what we had. And we had uh, 
We had shared a lot of that food with the community as well, but the students had a great learning experience. Um, and uh, I've got some incredible pictures of them with pitchforks, you know, helping to turn over the soil. So I'm sure, uh, Dave and Jim, that that program is going to be absolutely incredible once it gets developed. That, that's very exciting. I can a little take off on that. We uh, we established the Acu Garden here about five years ago. Uh, we have organic garden beds, but we're kind of kicking that up a notch. We're waiting for our freight farm to arrive, which is going to be a 40 by 10 by 10 hydroponic container that can grow vegetables and plants 24, 7, 365. And again, in the spirit of sustainability and teaching our team, we're going to be able to harvest our own salads and who knows where we'll go beyond that, but it's going to be a learning experience for us. But we're very excited to, we're supposed to be here this week, but due to supply chain issues across the world, and I'm not sure when we're going to see it, but hopefully we'll see it sooner than later. We ordered it back in December. <laughs> um, I do have one question here. We have a few minutes left on the chat. I'll read it and then I'll provide an answer and the panelists can chime in as well. Many black professionals that I've worked with have shared with me that they struggle with white workforce culture and navigating it. Some have shared that they are quieter than they'd like to be in order to not appear aggressive. Some have talked about code switching and how exhausting it is on them. I was wondering if you have any advice for people on how you, would ass how you assess the soft skills you look for when employees hold back because of their concern of how their skin color impacts how their comments, actions are perceived. So I can only speak from our experience at Accurounds. We have several people of color, uh, people of color that work here. Uh, Asians, we have a black an employee that started as a co-op from Southeastern Vogue Tech. He's in his 11th year of full-time employment and purchased a house last year. Um, I, I kind of just hearken back to the behaviors that are outlined in our core values. And we, we talk about these in conversations every single day and make sure that we don't alienate anyone and that we have an inclusive environment. And if we see anything diverting from that, we have an acronym here called PICNIC, positive, immediate, and certain, negative, immediate, and certain. If we see positive activity, we want to reinforce that right then and there. We don't want to wait. And the same on the negative side. If anything is diverting from taking away from anything regarding our core values, we address it head on. And, and thankfully, we made this change maybe six or seven years ago. And we added on to our facility and kind of stepped up our focus on culture. Uh, we've really minimized and eliminated a lot of maybe activity that that took place and kind of, you know, clashed with against our core values. So, um, you know, I walk around the plant when I'm here and I talk to everybody every day and I'm not talking about work. Most things are talking about life. And I think making people feel comfortable in the environment and that goes for me and our other, you know, coordinators and, and leaders here. It's important to have that culture that's prevalent throughout um, hope that answers your question, Kelly. And I don't, if there's any other panelists that want to pipe in, uh, feel free. We have uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll join Mike. Um, one of the things that that superintendent, again, Superintendent Thomas did last year, actually, prior, just prior to the pandemic, is we all of these district administration and and even the teaching staff, we we took this. Um, uh, through E Cornell University, you know the the diversity inclusion and, and it, it's it's kind of a awareness, you know, basically a, a um, program, and I I think it's very helpful. And and honestly, you know, for people of color, it's like it's it's nothing new. We we we, we went through it all, and we we live it every day. But for the people that are not people of color, you know, it was a bit eye opening, you know, to, to understand, you know, what white privilege is about and, and, and just those things that you talk about, you know, the people that are in groups and are at the table finally are in the room, but are hesitant to speak up and hesitant to bring their authentic self because yeah, you're perceived as a aggressive black man or, or, you know, for the most part, people of color, we can't have a bad day at work. We can't have a toothache. We can't have a headache. We can't have a, you know, we didn't sleep well, you know, but other people can, do what they do and say, oh, sorry, I had a bad night. And yeah, that's okay. That's just John. That's just Mary, but for everybody else. So it was really eye-opening, I think, for the not people of color to kind of see some of the things. And, and they had this like, questionnaire about white privilege. And they're like, oh, wow, didn't even know that. You know, I can walk into a bank. I can walk into a store and I can do anything. And, and it's not a problem. But 
they don't realize when people of color walk into a bank or walk into a store, you get followed around, you get, you know, you get, you get asked for 15 people, pieces of identification to cash a check, you know, you, it's just, it's a very different. And so it's, I would highly recommend that, you know, e e Cornell University class um, for, for any organization. It, 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 it helps to get the conversation started anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krabs. I appreciate that comment. I'm going to close with our last sentence in our DEI statement. Creating, <laughs> creating a culture of equality empowers our team members, accelerates innovation, and ultimately results in a better product for our customers. And that's really what it's all about. I want to thank our panelists. Tremendous dialogue and conversation. We created some connections here, and hopefully we can continue the dialogue and, and make STEM careers more aware throughout our entire communities and we're starving for talent. So we need people. And if they can abide by core values, they can get a job. So thank you, Stacey. Thank you, everyone. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mike, for facilitating a terrific panel. And thank you to all of our panelists, Chris, Dr. Cobbs, Yvette, uh, Dr. Oral, Pat, and Dr. Mangus for sharing um, all of your sentiments and your thoughtful reflections with all of us. They're certainly extremely inspiring um, to everyone. And we're so, so grateful for all of you being here.